to bet that uh, pretty much none of you has ever heard of the Emerging Technologies Group um, at Mozilla, and that's okay, uh, we're gonna fix that. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Firefox group, after all, that's the team, the engineering team at, at Mozilla that builds Firefox. In Emerging Technologies, we are the other uh, engineering team. Um, and our, a quick summary of, of our role is really the title of my talk, uh, Enabling New Web Experiences. Um, and so I'm hoping to uh, spend a little bit of time this afternoon at the end of the day walking you through the work that we're doing in the Emerging Technologies group, introducing that work and getting you acquainted with some of what um, we work on and what we do, but I have another motive um, in doing so, which is that I think it's fair to say that while the title is enabling new web experiences, we expect that actually building those web experiences is something that you all are gonna do. And so we have a very strong interest in spending a lot of time with developers, understanding what their needs are, what their requirements are, what technologies are relevant, what kind of new experiences would you like to be able to build or better versions of today's experience. And so I'm hoping that in walking through um, the various projects that we have underway and the technology areas that we're active in, uh, we'll find some place that'll spark some interest. You'll have an opportunity to come and talk to us uh, in, the, in the booth or, or tomorrow or, or Saturday, um, or just generally afterwards. Um, I will say though that I'm guessing you might be familiar, some of you at least, with the graphic uh, that's on the screen here. This uh, is something I hopefully you will have seen before. This is the Mark 57 power suit part of the visual identity that we created for Firefox Quantum, uh, the major update that we made to Firefox and launched in November of last year. And the reason for using that graphic in my talk is part of this new web experience enablement work that we did uh, was in playing a critical role in Firefox Quantum and in the components of the Mark 57 power suit. And so in our walking tour of, of emerging technologies, um, that's where we will actually start. So the story um, in that particular vein uh, begins with Rust. Uh, we, we've had a substantial effort in Rust. It was a programming language, and you may wonder why I talk about another programming language at a JavaScript conference. Um, but if you hang with me for a few slides, I think um, you'll see how, the, how the, the dots connect. But Rust is a programming language that um, was begun at Mozilla um, in earnest in about 2009. Um, and it was motivated by a problem that we had trying to maintain a large, complex C++, uh, six million lines of code um, product, and we kept bumping our heads against a couple of problems uh, that really took a lot of time and energy um, out of the product, out of our customers, and out of our engineering teams. And we began to wonder if these two major classes of products were products that we could actually find a better way to solve. One of those problems um, was that we were seeing the emergence of hardware um, that had a tremendous ability to, uh, to support parallelization and execution. More cores, more execution threads, um, and while it's great that the hardware had those capabilities, as, as programmers and as humans, as I'm sure many of you know, parallelizing things robustly is, is a non-trivial problem to solve. And so we had the suspicion um, that we could actually find ways to help us solve that problem in the programming languages that we used. Um, and so that was one motivation. The other one was that we spend, and you may actually too, spend a lot of time fixing problems that occur only after your product is built and deployed and out in the world and used by end users. Now maybe those products are crashes or performance issues, maybe they're security vulnerabilities, but there's a, a, a class of software issues that arise because of the dynamism in, in applications and the way in which they behave, especially for a web browser um, like Firefox, when it's out in the world absorbing all sorts of uh, unanticipatable comment, content um, and user interactions. And so the other problem we were interested in solving, uh, if we could, was to try and avoid having our engineers have to spend all that time finding and fixing and debugging those problems, and worse, having our customers go through the consequences of having those problems when the product was deployed and out in the field. So the Rust programming language was sort of built around um, the initial idea was the slogan was hack without fear. The idea really was to create a programming language where um, many of the runtime problems could actually be found and prevented by the compiler. So a large class of issues that you would have and you were programming a low-level language or systems programming language like C or C++ actually get caught by the compiler um, and never get out into the world to cause pain or anguish for your customers or for your engineers. 
Um, and the other one is it's optimized to really do, Rust is optimized to do a great job with parallelization and concurrency. And in fact, the initial mantra, hack without fear, makes a great t-shirt, but it doesn't actually tell you too much about the language, and that's evolved over time to be uh, more along the lines of fearless concurrency. So the, the, the first part of the story, and we have a small team um, uh, in the Emerging Technologies Group working on Rust, we have a large community working on Rust, um, is delivering the capabilities that we're living up to that potential in the programming language. The next piece of that story um, is a project called Servo. Uh, Servo is, uh, serves two purposes. One, it is a proof point for the Rust programming language. If you're gonna assert that you have a programming language that has new qualities the way Rust does, you really kinda have to back it up. You have to write a large body of code to demonstrate that you can actually make good on that potential. And so Servo is, um, an alternative web engine, um, not unlike uh, simple web engines that you find in browsers today. It's not a fully featured web engine, or certainly wasn't, wasn't in those days. The work started in 2012. Um, uh, and uh, the idea was to be able to pr not only prove the qualities of Rust, but actually give us a, way, a workbench upon which we could then do some of this work to parallelize the components of the web engine, taking advantage of the, of the properties of Rust um, and building new ways of doing layout um, or styling in the web browser built inherently around the language uh, enabling parallelization and then the hardware underneath really letting us take full advantage of it. Uh, a couple of other interesting benefits of doing the work on Servo is uh, it let us focus on embeddability. It's really great if you build these components. Um, it's even better in, in, inside of an engine. It's even better if you can use them in all sorts of other um, applications and services. And so Servo evolved over time and reached the point where, uh, whoops, in um, uh, early 2000, late 2016, where we realized we could actually take some of the components out of Servo and, and bring them to, uh, to Firefox as part of Firefox Quantum. And so we continue to have interesting work inside of um, the, what, the Emerging Technologies Group, not only in evolving the, the Rust programming language with the community, but in continuing to build and enhance the capabilities that are in Servo as a workbench for alternative web engine components, and then highlighting or, or uh, extrapolating from those components to put them in applications um, like Firefox, build a better engine, um, build a better platform, uh, and provide a better experience for end users in running the code uh, that we're all gonna build and deploy using the traditional components of the web, HTML, JavaScript, um, and CSS. The third project that fits in this little sub-narrative of my larger narrative is WebAssembly. Um, now, while I'm willing to bet many of you might not have been too familiar with Rust or with Servo, I'm hoping more of you are somewhat familiar with WebAssembly. Um, and I'll tell you, we'll talk a little bit more about what it is and why. Um, and it actually does a better job of relating to JavaScript, promise me, um, than, than Servo or Rust did. Um, er, and around about 2009, uh, we began to get concerned about the problems we were seeing uh, with uh, handling of JavaScript on the web. As web content got more sophisticated, as web applications became more, uh, more nuanced and richer, uh, developers were building larger and larger bodies of JavaScript um, and sending them over the wire as part of presenting a web application to the browser to be rendered on the screen. Uh, that's fine, uh, JavaScript grew as a language to give developers a lot of those capabilities, but one of the consequences of doing that is all of that JavaScript that gets sent over the wire as the page loads has to be parsed and compiled by the browser before it can actually be executed. And we began to theorize that um, if we didn't do something, we might ultimately reach a problem uh, where we were gonna see the performance limitation in web applications and content on the web um, was really gonna be bound up in the CPU um, of the device that was running the browser. Um, and we realized that was probably not a good idea. So we started an, a, an experimentation uh, effort to see if we could actually find ways to remove some of the impediments of parsing and compiling JavaScript in real time as it was loaded into the browser as part of displaying the page that the user wanted to see. Now the first step in that effort was a, process, or a project called asm.js. Um, and the idea with asm.js was to take a strict subset of JavaScript, statically typed, um, and, and think about it as an intermediate language representation that could be fed into a browser, could be compatible with every JavaScript-enabled browser on the planet, 
but could be built in such a way that it would be uh, efficient to execute, to load and to execute and to run into the browser and avoid some of the challenges of runtime handling of, of dynamic typing and other uh, pieces of the JavaScript language. Um, Asm.js um, was uh, you know, initially just an experiment, but it actually worked phenomenally well. Um, what we saw with Asm.js was um, the ability to actually streamline the delivery and the loading of content on the web, and the ability to actually craft, although it's kind of an odd looking programming language if you looked at it as a human, to craft runtime components to do interestingly complex computational things and get them you know, rendered and handled by the JavaScript engine in the browser, and more efficiently than sort of fully featured um, JavaScript. Uh, so asm.js was successful. It was typically not programmed in by humans. As I mentioned, it was an intermediate language, and so it was mostly produced by tool chains. Um, and in fact, compatible with, with the LLVM tool chain so that it was easy for us to build tools, and we did. Um, they could take other programming languages, C for example, and compile them down uh, and render them in asm.js and then efficiently feed them into the browser. That experiment worked well enough um, that we realized we could accomplish a number of things by evolving the technology forward and WebAssembly was born. Um, WebAssembly was designed to, to really be a complete virtual machine uh, inside of your browser. And so it's uh, pretty much the case today that every browser, every major browser, most of the browsers running in people's desktops certainly these days supports WebAssembly. It's a W3C standard. Um, and WebAssembly takes the architecture and the idea of, of asm.js and, and sort of pushes it to the limit. So, oops, now we have a, um, a a binary runtime uh, in the browser, um, and we can take representations in almost any other programming language um, and compile them down into WebAssembly and create modules that are extremely efficient to load and to run um, as part of your web application. And let's actually look at what that's gonna look like should you be interested in trying to do something like this. As you can see from the uh, simple recipe card here, uh, you start with uh, uh, some native code, uh, some assets that you may have, something that's computationally complicated or sophisticated, complex that would be inefficient uh, and not, uh, not run uh, proper particularly well as a JavaScript application and downloaded. You use the tool chain to compile it down to a WebAssembly module. The WebAssembly module gets bundled up into your web application along with all of the other regular components of your application, so JavaScript, images, assets, other sorts of things, packaged up um, as your web app, and then when the browser loads, it pulls all of those assets over, but takes advantage of the fact that the WebAssembly module is already pre-compiled and ready to much more efficiently load and execute in the browser. The end result is that um, large, complex features can be delivered in WebAssembly, and, and it is efficient enough that it's more, you can think of it more like loading an image. Uh, the, the, the load on the browser of actually processing and loading the WebAssembly module is a much lighter weight thing, and we see now with WebAssembly, applications can be built to run more at network speed, and so what the user gets when they, um, when they, they load the application is something that's much more uh, responsive and much more initially loads. And we're seeing all sorts of examples of people now taking WebAssembly and building very powerful web applications and delivering them today. So Google Earth, for example, recently announced um, that they have transformed um, Google Earth, moved away from their own version um, of native code that was compiled in as part of the environment um, and they're delivering Google Earth. Um, these days it's available with WebAssembly and we're seeing others, Facebook, uh, others use asm.js and WebAssembly to handle image loading, audio, encryption, other computationally expensive tasks um, and, and provide them on the web. And one of the, uh, the other reasons for making this uh, uh, sort of interesting path available to you and seeing what you can, can do with it um, is that we can take Rust, the programming language I mentioned earlier, um, and compile it and make it um, part of this WebAssembly pathway. And so you can actually get the benefits of Rust, the efficient memory management, the ready parallelization um, in code that can be compiled and rendered and built as part of your web app. Um, so now web applications can be much more um, diverse in terms of the assets they use and performance for end users um, is clearly a, a much happier thing. 
Um, and there are tools available to make it easier for you to do. If you're interested in WebAssembly, I mentioned it's supported in, in all of the major browsers. Um, no reason not to get familiar with uh, the technology and take advantage of it. Um, and one of the things we're eager to do is to make WebAssembly part of a larger collection of the tools, tool chains, and frameworks uh, that you have, uh, have access to and use on a regular basis. The benefits of that is, of course, you don't actually have to do anything. Um, as those tool chains um, and frameworks incorporate support for WebAssembly, all of the performance and, and network um, throughput of WebAssembly will accrue automatically in your web application, um, and that virtual CPU that's inside of every browser uh, becomes a much more powerful tool for you to run not only traditional web apps, but personal productivity apps or video editing or all sorts of other complex things uh, where you may even have native language assets or your teams have native language assets that you'd like to re be able to reuse um, uh, as part of building and delivering the app. So all of those are pieces um, that came in um, as part of Firefox today. A couple of others I'm gonna highlight here that we're working on sort of in the survey of what's happening um, in emerging technologies. Uh, uh, VR, uh, mixed reality, um, and speech. Now, I'll step back a little bit. Um, Web VR, I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with. We've had demos in the lobby. If you've never had a virtual reality headset on, uh, I, I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to do it. Um, in 2016, uh, we began work in earnest on web VR um, as the rest of the industry was excited about virtual reality in general. Um, and the goal in those days with web VR was to uh, simply demonstrate that the web was a viable place um, for virtual reality. Uh, Mozilla worked with Google. We built a standard uh, or initial implementation that was ultimately standardized by the W3C of a web VR API. And the idea being that we wanted to expose the interfaces that you needed in order to create um, a virtual experience through the web to all of the typical ways in which you build and deploy web content today so that if you're familiar with HTML, CSS, and Java, all right, JavaScript, it would be easier for you to actually then expand the 2D kinds of web experiences you build today to be something that was a virtual reality-based 3D kind of web experience. Um, that, was too th uh, that was great. Uh, it was an easy thing to do. Um, but we learned that there were a lot of opportunities to really put more powerful development tools um, in a creator's hands, developer's hands, to make it easier for them to build and share compelling web VR experiences, uh, which gave rise to A-Frame. Um, A-Frame is a, an easy language or tool set that uh, you can avail yourself of if you're a familiar web developer to actually build and share components and construct entire virtual reality experiences um, and easily deploy them on the web using um, all of the same techniques that you're familiar, familiar with today. Uh, one of the things we've learned from the web VR standard and from making A-Frame available um, is there are a lot of people interested in doing this. Uh, telemetry that we, we have in Firefox tells us that about a million Firefox users in the course of navigating the web every day encounter uh, some sort of VR content or experience that each day. So that's actually perhaps a surprising um, uh, expanse of web VR that's available. People are using it for 3D, uh, 360 video and for other things, but we saw a lot of growth in 2016 and 17 um, in web VR, in the use of A-Frame, and the tools that were provided as part of the A-Frame environment. So uh, if you're interested in trying to build uh, a piece of virtual reality or component that can be shared in virtual reality, then stop by and talk to us. We can show you how to use A-Frame or a painter um, if you're an artist to, to actually build and create that technology and, and make it easy to use. Now, as big as virtual reality was, especially in 2016 and 2017, um, even more buzz and interest uh, in the market around augmented reality. Um, and in fact, the nomenclature evolved so fast uh, that what we now talk about is mixed reality. So mixed reality is the combination of virtual reality and augmented reality, um, and it's ways to actually blend the 2D world and the 3D world and the actual physical um, real world and create a whole new class of experiences for end users there as well. So just as we worked to propose 
a standard interface for WebVR. We've proposed a standard interface for mixed reality, um, and there is a Web XR um, uh, API that's available now that you can begin to experiment um, and easily build and deploy virtual reality experiences using the web as a platform in about 10 lines of code. Um, and we've provided not only the ability to do it in desktop browsers, uh, such as Firefox, um, but we also have an open source mixed reality viewer that'll run on an iOS enabled mobile device all off of the same back-end mixed reality content, um, and therefore make it easy for all of you as web developers to create virtual reality, um, augmented reality, and other kinds of experiences on top of the same platforms and tool chains um, that you're using every day. One of the things we learned from putting virtual reality and mixed reality capabilities in the hands of developers and end users um, is that uh, you begin to want even other kinds of new experiences on the web as part of creating those new environments. It's not particularly convenient uh, in the middle of a virtual real reality session um, to actually try and use a keyboard to type, uh, to provide input or commands or options. And so one of the, the logical consequences of building more of these kinds of augmented reality experiences and mixed reality experiences is you began to want to be able to talk um, to your web browser, talk to the web. And so another area of activity for us in the Emerging Technologies Group at Mozilla um, is around speech and speech recognition. Uh, Deep Speech uh, is one of those projects, uh, and it's an effort we began last year to build a completely open source speech to text engine based on machine learning. Now, speech recognition has been around for a long time. It was well established uh, when I was in, in college many years ago. Um, but most of the speech technologies that you, we encounter in the world around us today are relatively closed proprietary ecosystems, and they're not particularly readily available to us as web developers to build and deploy in any kind of web-based content. So we embarked upon the Deep Speech Project um, to really provide a completely accessible, open, but useful um, speech recognition engine, and also give us a platform that we could use to make speech recognition available for more languages and more cultures broadly than is available through some of the more typical commercial uh, systems. So Deep Speech um, launched officially uh, two months ago. Um, we have Python, JavaScript, and command line uh, versions of it that are accessible that can be incorporated in your application or backend service. The word error rate uh, is about 6.5%. That's approximately how well we do as humans. Um, so you, you've misunderstood 6.5% of my words, but um, deep speech is actually capable of, of a, a, a roughly human performance. Um, and to demonstrate how you can use it, uh, we did a test pilot experiment in Firefox called VoiceFill, where we packaged up um, uh, access to the deep speech engine and allowed you to actually conduct searches and other interactions uh, through the VoiceFill uh, add-on to Firefox uh, just using your voice. So I'm, I'm sure you have talked to your browser um, on and off for many years. Now you can actually talk to your browser and it will do something. Um, and we're eager to work with folks not only to um, expand the, the, the engine and make it available in more environments, but also to work on the corpus of text that goes along with it. Speech recognition, as we've implemented in Deep Speech, is a machine learning based um, application, and it needs to be trained. Uh, and the more data uh, that you have, the better the training is, the more effective the recognition is. Um, and so, in parallel with Deep Speech, we launched uh, a thing called Project Common Voice. And the idea of Common Voice was to use the web to collect the speech data that we needed to train and improve um, the deep speech engine. So uh, we, we, we went live with, with Common Voice. We asked people to voluntarily give us samples of, of their voice. And so if you still could do it if you like. You can go to the Common Voice website, um, offer to volunteer your voice. Uh, we'll ask you to read some snippets of text, um, and you do that using the microphone in your, in your computer with the browser. We will record those samples um, and then accumulate them in a large backend database. And then we have other people who volunteer to actually listen to those samples and ver verify that you actually said what we asked you to say. Um, and so over the course of the last several months, uh, 400,000 people 
have con or 400,000 voice recordings have been contributed to the Common Voice database from 20,000 speakers. That's over 500 hours um, of, uh, of, of text. Um, and the community has, has been part of creating the, the voice corpus and database, and we now have people working to provide language support not only for English, but for French, German, Spanish, Macedonian, Urdu, Persian, and Kurdish, and more languages are, are coming as we can enable more of the data collection on the back end. And so common voice and deep speech together means that you now have access to technologies to let you take an, a, a traditional web experience and build a speech input a component to it or build new kinds of experiences and deliver them on the web where speech is a viable means of users actually interacting with your content or your applications or your service. Uh, the last piece of the Emerging Technologies Organization that I'm gonna talk about is actually not uh, a piece that's oriented towards any of the engineering efforts like the ones I've been describing, but we actually have, uh, the, the Emerging Technologies Organization is the home for Mozilla's developer outreach effort. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. One is um, our focus on uh, developer outreach is really broadly across all of the web and the technologies uh, that make up the web. This is a reflection of Mozilla's mission where we're all about the internet first and foremost and, and making uh, the internet open and, and free and accessible and empowering for all. And so clearly we advocate uh, for a wide range of technologies well beyond those that are incorporated um, in Mozilla's product. Uh, WebAssembly is a good example of that. Um, and so the work that we did um, in, in advocating for WebAssembly adoption led to it being pervasively uh, present in all of the web browsers. Um, and one of the positive benefits of that was that it allowed us to get to the point where uh, application developers that had been using Flash and had been reliant on plugins in the browser to get access to that native functionality no longer had to do so. And through WebAssembly, um, we were able to provide a mechanism where we could deprecate native plugins and deprecate Flash, and that was all not because we built it into Firefox, but because we designed it and built it for the web and we advocated it from a developer perspective um, for all browser vendors to adopt. Additionally, it's important for us from a developer perspective to be aligned with everything else that's going on in emerging technologies, and so we're just as happy to talk to you about the APIs or the tools or the standards or anything else that you may require as developers to really help you uh, adopt or become more involved with any of the other uh, technologies that I've just talked about that we're working on um, in emerging technologies. So we're just as happy uh, to talk about where your needs may be if you're interested in building a speech-based um, interface to the web or a mixed reality-based one. Um, and all of that work can be taken uh, up through the developer outreach team as part of the emerging technologies group. And so um, that brings us to the end of our tour. I didn't actually talk about everything that we're doing in, in emerging technologies. We have a, a number of other um, efforts that are underway that are probably less relevant um, in this audience, but I will highlight um, that we're doing work on a royalty-free high-quality audio and video codecs. And so if you're interested in delivering high-quality media on the web and, and doing so in a royalty-free way, we should talk. Uh, we're part of the Alliance for Open Media in support of those uh, technologies that are becoming available. And we also have um, some early phase work on the Web of Things. Um, and so some of the technologies that Flocky showed us earlier in terms of bringing JavaScript and the web into uh, microcontrollers and hardware um, is work that we're also engaged in. And we'd certainly be happy uh, to talk to you about any of that work. Uh, lastly, in this space, uh, we're spending a bunch of time on, I mentioned machine learning as part of speech, but we know that machine learning is a technology or, uh, that's gonna be pervasively interesting or applicable in a wide range of ways across the, the broader web. Um, and we're happy to explore the intersection of machine learning um, and assistance and what that might be interested, uh, of interest to you all. So, um, thank you very much. That's me. Um, catch us in the, in the booth outside uh, or talk to us tomorrow and we'd be happy to find out what you're interested in and how we can make some of this technology more accessible or valuable to you going forward.